Americans for Prosperity North Dakota proudly supported important policy improvements that broke barriers for all North Dakotans this legislative session. From tackling unnecessary and burdensome occupational licensing standards to fighting for tax relief, AFP is proud to have played a part in improving the lives of North Dakotans this year. Join AFP today by visiting www.afpnd.org. This advertisement was paid for by Americans for Prosperity. Dane DeCray from the North Dakota ACLU joins me now. Dane, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me again. Your organization, I want to talk to you about two things today. First, I want to talk to you about your organization's push to end cash bail in North Dakota. And I also want to talk about your push to address um, the rising number of police officers that we have in our schools. Um, But let's talk about cash bail first. Um, tell me, what, what what exactly do you want to see happen? Well, what we want to ultimately see happen is we want to see our system in North Dakota move away from using whether or not someone has money as the reason for whether or not they can be released from jail while they're waiting for their trial to happen. So essentially now what happens is we, if, if you get arrested – and you go before a judge and a judge makes a decision about, you know, if, if, if you want to be able to get out of jail pending resolution of your charges, whether it's trial or a plea agreement or what have you, um, you put up a you put up a bond. Right? You put up bail. I think we're all pretty familiar with this. And then there's bail bonds people who, you know, basically help finance that. But but what your argument is, from what I've been reading, is that that creates a sort of, of financial where people who can afford bail or afford to finance it in some way, they get out. But if you're poor, you have to stay in jail. And if you stay in jail, I mean, not only does that have consequences for your life, if you're in jail, you can't go to work, you can't take care of your kids, you can't do all those things that, that, that we're supposed to do that, we, that we're responsible for, but you also can't participate, at least not as fully, in your defense, right? Because you can, if you're in jail, then your attorney can only come at certain times. I mean, that's sort of, you know, prescribed uh, your ability to go out and maybe do research on your own or, or gather information or what have you is is obviously you can't do it because you're in jail. So it, it's, it creates sort of an economic barrier, right? Where people who have money can get out and do all those things and people who don't end up sitting in jail, whether they're ultimately found guilty or not. That's all exactly right, Rob. What cash bail does is it jails the poor and it releases the rich. And that has a lot of consequences that you've outlined, but it also has some other ones that I think are important for people to realize when they're thinking about cash bail versus a different type of system. And the first one is that the cash bail system doesn't actually make us safer because your release entirely depends on your pocketbook. So if you're poor but not dangerous, you're not going to be released. Whereas if you're rich and you could be dangerous, you have an opportunity to be released. And to us, that makes no sense. And it should be the opposite of what we want as a community. We should be wanting to keep dangerous people in jail until their trial happens, and we should want to release people who aren't. Well, how does it the work? Second I, mean, thing, I, mean, oh, I, mean, I mean, basically, you go before a judge, right? I mean, the, the judge can decide if somebody's too dangerous to let out on bail, right? The judge can decide. Um, and so I do agree that when a person is so dangerous, I don't think a judge is going to offer cash bail, but there are situations where there is just a higher amount of cash bail to think that will prevent the person from being released. But if they can pay it, they're going to be able to get back out on the street. Yeah. And so that's kind of the issue okay. that we have. All right, go, go ahead, continue. Sure. The second thing is that it's actually pretty expensive to do our cash bail system because usually a person's bail amount is pretty low. Uh, whereas the cost of pretrial jailing them is high. So pretty quickly, it makes more financial sense for the jail to actually pay the person's bail rather than keep them locked up, which, again, we think makes no sense. And and when we're we're talking about keeping them locked up, this is sometimes for a significant amount of time. Um, We it could be weeks. It could be months. Um, I remember and granted this was in a federal jurisdiction, but I remember uh, back in my private investigator days, we were actually uh, appointed by the federal government to the defense counsel for uh, somebody in, in the state of Alaska who was kept in jail for 
years and then ultimately was was found innocent of of the charges uh so this was an innocent person kept in jail for years pending trial while his you know the, the trial and all those you know all that finagling and everything else uh un, un, uh unfolded he was in jail that whole time and then ultimately was released in an innocent man to to do what i guess try to find a job after you know explaining to people i was in jail for two years but i wasn't you know i wasn't guilty like i mean that's a hell of a thing right and that's common. I mean, when I think people think of cash bail, they think, oh, the person just has to stay in jail over the weekend. Yeah. But that's not true. They have to stay for weeks or months. And if a bail is $1,000 or even $500, within a few days, if not to a week, it costs more money to actually jail them than it would to release right. them and have them come back. And well, there's, so there's, we set up right. this situation there's, where there's food, taxpayers there's, are spending the money. Yeah, they're, because there's food and everything. Also, if they have some sort of a medical problem while they're in jail, I mean, there's there's some level of, of care, obviously, that we, obviously that, that we, we have to provide. We're not going to not not take care of them. But, you know, I mean, there's there's a lot of expenses that go into that. Do you have statistics like, like how long people are staying in jail pre-trial? I mean, can we quantify this beyond anecdotes? You know, I don't have those statistics directly in front of me right okay. now, but okay. I, I think it's weeks to months from the beginning of an arrest until an actual trial. Okay. So I, I think at this point, a lot of people are hearing, okay, well, if, if cash bail is, is not a great mechanism, I, I, think, I think maybe you could argue once upon a time it made sense, you know, you know maybe, maybe years and years ago, you know, where we wanted, we, we want to try, I mean, because everybody's presumed innocent until guilty. And so we want to balance that. You know, the, the need for public safety against, hey, uh, let's, you know, let people out of jail until they're actually found guilty so that they can participate in their defense and et cetera, et cetera, and all those other things. And so maybe cash bail, cash bail was the right mechanism 100 years ago or 50 years ago. I'm just not sure in 2019 it still is. And, but, but I think a lot of people are thinking, OK, well, then what's the alternative? If, if we're not doing cash bail, how do we balance that need for public safety with you know, let's get people who aren't dangerous out of jail, uh, you know, until they're actually found guilty. Sure. And I think that North Dakota is actually taking a good step here. And um, as you probably know, they are starting a pilot program within the state to look at different ways to release people uh, instead of just using cash bail. And so the Department of Corrections and pretrial services and probation are going into some cities in North Dakota, and they're going to be looking at this very issue. What should we do instead? And so I am hoping for us as the ACLU to be involved in that, at least in the Fargo area, because we are interested to see what those other options look like. The one I can tell you that I know from my previous job is the federal system. The federal system got rid of cash bail in the 1980s, and instead, they have two things that judges look at when they decide whether or not a person has to stay in jail or can be released. The first one we've been talking about, which is, is that person too dangerous to be put back into the community? And the second question is, if the person is released, will he, sh he or she show back up for court? So if they're not too dangerous and they can be assured they're going to show back up for court, based on, you know, their previous history or um, living in the community, community ties, then that person can be released without having a cash bail. And so that equals the system and makes it fair for everyone instead of it being about how much money you have. So would, would, would you be in favor of some, I mean, if, if, if we, so, so basically you're talking about just a system where we just make a determination. If you're not dangerous, you get out and there's no bail? That's right. And that's exactly what the federal system is about. And the idea for that is they saw this very problem bubbling up, that people who were more affluent, had more money, were getting released at higher rates and for everything else being equal. And that didn't make any sense. And so people who were poor were being treated unfairly. And so they just changed the system. What about, I mean, what, what about people who aren't perhaps a danger to the public, but might abscond, right? Because that's the other part of, of bond is it's some level of certainty that they're going to come back for their hearings and for their trial and everything else. And they're not going to abscond to Mexico or something. Uh, you know, wh wh what about that? I mean, maybe they're not dangerous, but you're just not real sure that they're actually going to come back. They're going to flee, you know, particularly maybe if it's like a minor charge where, you know, the state's not going to put a lot of resources into going hunting for them and they just go to another state. What, uh, you know, I mean, what, 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 what about that situation? 
Well, if the person's from this community where they're charged with a crime, I think it's probably hard a little bit to believe that they would leave the entire state and their whole life to avoid a small charge. But I take your point that there is always going to be a risk if you release people that they're not going to show back up for court, which is kind of the way the reason for cash bail in the first place. But there's other ways to ensure that the person is going to show up other than simply their cash bail, because by that same argument, if the bail amount isn't all that much, they could simply just walk away from that money and leave the state yeah. in the same scenario. That's true. So what we've seen that's better, at least in the federal system, and also um, in the research that we've done, is having them check in regularly with probation officers. Having a third party, like a relative or a spouse, come to court and say, I'm going to watch over this person, and if anything happens, you have my word that I'm going to contact the court or the probation officer. You know, there's other ways than simply having it be this arbitrary cash amount that some people may blow off anyway. So we just think that the cash system creates an incentive sure. that doesn't actually hold people who are going to run anyway. You know, that's kind of how the criminal law and the criminal system is. There's always going to be people who work around it, but we're just trying to find the best solution for the most amount of people. I wrote a column about this, and one thing I got to thinking about was, like, tracking devices. I mean, we're, we're moving into an era where stuff like that is pretty cheap. I mean, parents can get, like, apps and things to track their children or their pets. Uh, and, and, you know, I don't want to, you know, make it seem like the accused are animals, but I mean, what about tracking? I mean, if, if you're, if you're due to show back up for trial, I mean, is, is that something that, that would fit this, this equation? That's an option that is, happens in a lot of jurisdictions, yeah. in a lot of yes. courtrooms. I'm asking but you, a you, member of the ACLU, to uh, <laughs> whether or not you like the idea of tracking people, but I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm a libertarian myself, but I mean, if, if the alternative is they're going to sit in jail, I don't know that a tracking bracelet to me is that bad of a that bad of a thing. I think that it's better, but I still think that the other solutions that I discussed do just as well without having to add that layer of government tracking and government surveillance. But if the decision or the question is literally just should they stay in jail or should they be released with a tracking device, I would probably agree that a tracking device is better for both your preparation of defense and for making the system more fair for all yeah. of the accused. And I like the idea of giving judges a spectrum of options, too. Uh, you know, I mean, maybe maybe the, the judge could say, hey, we can just let this person out. They're not a danger. You know, mom's vouching for them or dad's vouching or whoever is vouching for them. They're going to check in the probate. That's fine with me. Or maybe this other person, eh, I'm not so sure about. Maybe we'll put a bracelet on them. I, I mean, I, I, I guess I like the judges, you know, being able to look at somebody there and make a determination and have a lot of different options to say, hey, let's make sure that you're going to come back to court and you're not going to be a danger to the public, et cetera, et cetera. I, I, so I, I don't know. I, I like I like lots of options. Um, and that's, that's exactly the way the federal system is. The probation yeah. office works with the defense lawyers and the judge to try to tailor each situation to the individual person, which I think is the ultimate yeah. goal because everyone's going to have different needs, different charges, different histories. Right. So – our big issue with the cash bail system is kind of a one-size-fits-all that ends up kind of fitting none. So we want that individualized um, mechanism that you talk about. Well, it's going to be interesting to see what comes from the pilot program here in North Dakota. And, and I agree with you. I, I think our lawmakers are doing a great job of, of pursuing some of these and beginning to study some of these and, and finding the right solutions. Let's switch gears. Let's talk about school resource officers, basically cops in schools. I just wrote my Sunday column about this. Um, I think uh, there's, there's been a push to put more cops in schools lately. I, I think a lot of it is the school shooting situation. They get a lot of attention, and that has led people to think a lot more about school security. And I think a lot of people are thinking, yeah, okay, a cop on hand who's, who's already there you know, is a pretty good defense mechanism if somebody were to try to atta attra attack a school. Um, but the ACLU, nationally, but also talking specifically about North Dakota – has come out, and some pretty interesting statistics, uh, Dane. You found that in North Dakota, 53% of students attend a school that has a law enforcement presence, uh, but 74% of students go to a school that doesn't have the, the recommended ratio of students to guidance counselors. Now, to, to me, I and obviously I'm a conservative, I'm a pro-Second Amendment guy, 
I think some of the concern about school shootings has been a little overblown. I think sometimes, I, I know they get a ton of attention from the media. I know they get a t- ton of attention from the pundits and the politicians. But statistically, they are exceedingly rare. It is far more likely that students are going to struggle with something like suicide or depression or bullying or issues like that than they are somebody coming in and trying to shoot up their school. And, and, I, and I worry that, that putting law enforcement officers there, and I think this is the argument, and I, I don't want to speak for the ACLU, obviously, but, but for, from my point of view, and I've been arguing this for a while, if you put law enforcement officers in there, law enforcement officers have training to deal with situations a certain way. They come in and they deal with criminals, and they're, they have a, a spectrum of tools that they can use against criminals, including arresting them, using force against them. We're now taking those people and we're putting them in schools, and I think it's exceedingly well-meaning. And I don't want to. I don't want to talk down to cops. I think cops. I, I'm, I'm. I'm the son of a cop. I'm pro cop. I just don't know that that's the right situation. In the same way that we don't use our military to police, right? We have a distinction between civilian law enforcement and the military because the military has a much different purpose. I don't know that I necessarily want cops patrolling the hallways of our schools because I'm afraid they're going to react to. You know, they're going to be involved in school discipline issues, and and react to them like cops. Am I off the rails here, Dane? I mean, would, would, describe the ACLU's position. Sure. I, I think you make a lot of good points, and I think that our what we are um, discussing in the column today is very similar to what you are kind of saying. The idea for us is that when you put police officers in school, at that point, you're kind of at the... the end of the line in terms of what you can do to try to prevent those bad things that we want those police officers in the school for. And so it's a resource question. Do we want to put those resources upstream to counselors and people like that to try to maybe do early interventions to avoid the end of the line issue that you discuss, which is, you know, at its worst, school shootings. And those are tragic. And those are, everyone is horrible. But you're right. Statistically, they're very rare. And so the question for us, the first question is, do we want to use those resources for that, or do we want to try to use them for those upstream things to try to prevent them from happening in the first place by those early interventions? And the second issue... I I I want to pause there, because that's that's such a great point. Cops are reactionary, right? I mean, you, you call the cops when something has already gone bad. Right, somebody is already hurting somebody else. Somebody is already committing a crime. Something bad is already happening. That's where the cops step in, and they're trained to deal with those situations. But are we putting enough resources in, in to people who can who can intervene and say, "Hey, this student's having some problems. Let's let's focus in on that and let's get them some resources and get them some support, and, and maybe prevent something bad from happening to begin with." I, I think that's such a great point. Right, and not only preventing something bad from happening, but just doing a Uh, the other things that you talk about, students who are experiencing depression, students who are thinking possibly about suicide, who are having trouble at home. I mean, there's so many things that we can do upstream with that money that we think is better spent, especially at a school. You know, this isn't out in the real world where people are over the age of 18 and have, you know, done all these things. This is really a time where we have young minds who we have a chance to get to early if we, you know, direct our spending in a different way. And so that's why, you know, it's not about us being anti-cop in that regard. We just think we want an upstream approach rather than that reactive approach. I just, yeah, but I, it, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, that's okay. And the second part is exactly what you talked about. Um, Police officers are trained a certain way to deal with certain things. And they are, we think, not well equipped to deal with the sort of things that happen in schools the way that we've historically dealt with them. And so our fear is that when police officers are in schools, they're going to patrol schools like they patrol the beat. And things that could just be solved with simple interventions and simple discipline get escalated and elevated into arrests. And that sort of stuff um, carries on with students for a long, long time. Whereas when I was in school or you were in school, that probably never would happen. And well, that's, so that's, that's exactly just, what I'm thinking about. Because I, I remember I got, I, got, um, I got some in-school suspension one time when I was in high school. And what happened was me and another boy, as teenage boys are wont to do, 
got into a shoving match in the hall. And, you know, we we didn't like it. I, I don't even remember what it was about. It was some dumb kid thing. And we got into a shoving match. And we ended up, you know, a couple weeks later, we were, we were buddies again, right? But at the, in that moment, we were shoving each other. We were going at each other. And principal broke it up. Uh, we both got a couple of days of in-school suspension. We had to go sit and do our schoolwork somewhere else. And that was it. What I'm afraid of is that if, if, if a school resource officer intervenes, then we're going to get arrested. And then maybe there's going to be misdemeanor assault charges. We've now escalated something that and, and, and treated it in a way that, that neither one of us really treated. I mean, we were just a couple of dumb teenage boys doing dumb teenage boy things. And the principal intervened and, and cleared it up. And, and it was fine. And I worry if, if, if you get a law enforcement officer involved, now it's a law enforcement issue. And now it's something else entirely that, that it maybe doesn't need to be. That's right. And it could have other collateral consequences. If there's an arrest, it's probably hard for that student to come back to that school. There's pol- probably policies related to suspension or expulsion. And there's time out of the classroom. And then there's just, you know, more of a stigma or fear or issues within school where, you know, in high school or in school, you usually want to turn to people in authority for assistance. But if there's a resource officer, and this goes back to just people's feelings about police officers, I don't mean this one way or another, but they're less likely probably to go to that person with issues. And so it just creates a different sort of dynamic than we think is appropriate for schools and that we've had in the past. And it's all for this protection for that very thing that you talk about, which statistically almost never happens. Not because it's not tragic, but it's a thing where we just have to decide, is that small chance uh, worth all of these potential consequences that we've outlined and we've discussed, and we don't think it is. Yeah, I I, I think you're right. I and I, I shouldn't say everything's better. I I know our superintendent of schools, Kirsten Baszler, she had an idea where you know patrolling uh, law enforcement officers, you know sometimes they have to stop and do paperwork or whatever. You know her idea was why not do that at a school? You know park the squad car out front for a while, do your paperwork, maybe do it in the school. My problem is is where you have the officers dedicated and they're patrolling the hallways. I don't have a problem with law enforcement, you know, being present, being visible sometimes at our schools just as a deterrent uh, or just to you know make sure there's nothing nefarious going on, d- doing cop things. But when it comes to patrolling the hallways, man, I'd, I'd rather have assistant principals doing that. I'd rather have teachers doing that. I'd rather have counselors doing that. And I'd rather have, you know, if kids are having a problem, uh, it, instead of, you know, getting arrested and booked, uh, you know, maybe they need to sit down and talk to a counselor for a while and say, hey, why are you so angry? Why are you so mad? What can we do? Uh, I, I think that's so much better for our society. Yep. And, and in North Dakota, we don't have those counselors 74% of the time. And so that's the other part that we really need to look at because kids in tough times need those sort of resources. And we want them not just in the big cities in North Dakota, but all across our communities, all across the state. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Dane, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Absolutely. I'll talk to you again soon, I hope.